Welcome to Black Nouveau. This is our edition for September 23rd, 2015. I'm Joanne Williams. September is National Prostate Health Month. We'll talk with two prostate cancer survivors and a cancer specialist. We'll show you how some of the younger members of our community helped other kids go back to school. And the president of MATC explains the MATC promise. It's a promise of a free college education for all high school graduates. We begin, though, with Dream Girls, the Tony Award-winning musical now playing at the Milwaukee Repertory Theater. Everett Marshburn went backstage. I'm telling you now it's got to win. No more trusting in my friends. We're going to change our style, change our tone, make the songs we sing our own. Step into, Step into the bad side. side. It's the first week in September, and the cast and crew for the Milwaukee Reps production of Dream Girls is busy at work. Almost a decade ago, the story of the rise of three young black girls to music superstardom hit the silver screen. Based loosely on a number of girl groups from the 1960s, the film won two Oscars and made a superstar out of Jennifer Hudson. Every man has his own special dream, and your dream is just about to come true. And 25 years before the film was made, the original Broadway production won six Tony Awards and made a superstar out of Jennifer Holliday. I feel that the, the, the play is definitely about the journey of um, dreams coming true. Um, um, which is interesting because, you know, in real life, you have this idea of what you want your life to be um, and this path that you think your life should go in, but it doesn't always end up that way. But you kind of like get there in the, the journey the way that God wants you to get there. And I think it has that, you know, type of thing where you can have an idea, but it's not going to always map out the way that you want it to be. Dream Girls is about... Um the struggle um, to chase your dream. And it, um, it follows three young ladies from um, Chicago um, who are loosely based on the Supremes. Um, some say the Supremes, some say Pat LaBelle and the Bluebells. I believe it's um, a combination of the two. Um, and how they um, go to New York and meet this Curtis guy. Um, and James Thunder Early, Jimmy Early, who I play, who um, changes the scope of their career and the path of their life. Step into the bad side. Hey, I had to take my step for me. Right? You know the smell I had is going away. You know I see you look on the face. Step into the bad side. Step into the bad side. The musical is also a journey through black music in the United States in the 1960s and 70s. Hey, hey, it definitely um, follows the uh, impact that um, Tamla Records and Motown Records and Chess Records um, had on not only the American um, music scene, but the world of music as a whole. It introduced a whole new sound, um, the gospel quartet sound put to pop music, I mean, to R&B music, or, um, and, and then with a little pop flair. Um, it um, introduces the concept of black music or race music being accessible to the entire world through pop culture, being, um, being accessible through um, on the pop charts and on the um, national televised shows at the time. The production team definitely wants to entertain audiences, but they also want the show to be uplifting. We talked about um, wanting the the audience, especially young girls and. Um, older women even to walk away with empowerment um, because you encounter these women who go through this journey in life starting from their teens up into adulthood and they end up reaching their goals um, even though they have some ups and they have the, the, the downs of it, it did not stop them. I want some seven-year-old boy or seven-year-old girl um, 
specifically a seven-year-old boy of color or a seven-year-old girl of color, to walk out of that theater and go, I can do that. I can do that. Try to be good! Dream Girls continues at the Milwaukee Rep through the 1st of November. The MATC Promise is a new initiative created by the Milwaukee Area Technical College. It's going to provide free college education to local high school graduates. Joining us to explain the new program is Dr. Vicki Martin, the president of MATC. Welcome. Thank you. First Glad to be thing, here. Yes. what is it? Well, the MATC Promise is free tuition and fees for two full-time years, which means four consecutive semesters, and MATC for eligible seniors. Why did you decide to do this? And it wasn't just you. Why did the people who were offering this decide to do it? Right. Well, um, I was at a conference. Well, first of all, let's start with President Obama, who started out with the College Promise campaign, America's Promise, um, to, to young people, and just the idea of a free college tuition. And so uh, we had looked at that and said, would that just be great for our students to get two free years of college and to get a great start on their education and to be debt free? And then um, I was at a conference, a national conference of the American um, Association of Community Colleges, and there was a presentation on the Tennessee Promise. In the whole state of Tennessee, the governor has set aside $300 million uh, from lottery uh, dollars for this very purpose for all uh, throughout the whole state that the first two years of a two-year college would be free. And so I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, well, I, I don't think Wisconsin is ready or is, is on the precipice of doing this. But I started to think about, but could we? Should we? And then I was thinking, we have to do this. And as they explained how the program worked, that it was after um, they applied the federal and state grants and they paid the difference between tuition and fees and what they got from the grants, that I began to think it was really possible. Okay, so tell mm -hmm. me how it's going to work. If I have a, somebody who's going to graduate from high school in 2016, right. what, what do I have to do? Okay, so we're going to ask um, those students to apply by December 1st. And then we'll have a really good idea about how many students we're talking about and the different career areas that they're interested in. And then what we're going to do is help them through the financial aid process because that's what we have found with national data and our own data that shows that that is probably the most daunting part of going to college is completing the financial aid form. The other thing is a lot of students wait till the last minute and by then usually all the grants are gone. And so um, what's going to happen is we're going to help them through workshops either on our campus or in their high schools to help them complete that form with their, with their family because it really is about the estimated family contribution of $3,000 or less that makes them eligible. And what that means for a family of four is about $38,000. And we know a family of four who is making $38,000 cannot afford $3,000 to go to school. So we thought we would pay the difference of that um, for our students who are interested in that. So we'll help them complete that form. And then when we find out the students who are eligible, uh, they must also meet all the other eligibility requirements, which is they must stay in school at least 90% of the time. And we're really hoping that this helps them to understand that going to school and being in school is really important for college success as well. Is the grade point average critical? Yes. Um, we, we really focused in on the senior year, the 2.0, because we thought if students didn't really have much hope of having access to college in terms of affordability, they may not have really applied themselves well in high school. So we thought, okay, if we tell them that it'll be free if they meet the 2.0 grade point average in their senior year, that will demonstrate to us that they're willing to work hard and they're committed to their own success. So give me the deadlines again. When do I have to do what? The main thing is December 1st to apply and then we're going to help with the other pieces in terms of financial aid. It has to be done by March. Um, and then they'll be taking their ACTs, which we look at the composite score of 16, and that has to be completed by May. And hopefully we can help them through this whole process, help them to stay in school, help them to get good grades and do well on the ACT so that they are eligible for this program. 
so they can look forward to going to METC without having to pay a lot of money. Right. Well, yeah, tuition free. <laughs> tuition fees are free. Sounds pretty good. Yeah. Uh, how can folks get more information about this? Um, they can go to our website, matc.edu. We also have a phone number that they can call, and it's a dedicated line uh, specifically for students who are interested in this. Okay. And is there a, a number of students that you'll accept or anybody who walks well, we're in? We're targeting the first year 1,000 students. A thousand? A thousand. That would yes. be wonderful. It really would. I mean, we really think it's game-changing. It could really make a difference in our community and really address the issues of poverty that we're seeing. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Vicki Martin, the president of MATC, talking about the MATC promise. And maybe you'll come back a year from now and tell us how successful it was. That'd be great. Thank Thanks you so much. Thanks for coming on Black Nouveau. Thank you. This is one of the many back-to-school celebrations held in Milwaukee. Second and center was the site of this back-to-school education fair put on by one of the chapters of Omega Psi Phi International Fraternity, an organization that believes in service and community service in particular. There's a need for educated, college-educated men in our various communities, so we need to be a, a voice and a beacon out here in our area to make sure that those who are out here realize there are people out here that have succeeded and can succeed so that they can do the same thing. The organization had a lot of partners and volunteers involved to make this event happen. And along with school supplies, health, trade, and historical information was given out. Plumbing is the way to go. Or any trade, but that's any trade, any trade. Plumbing, sprinkler fitting, pipe fitting. Work with your hands. Tell me this: the piping in your house doesn't look like doesn't look like this, or doesn't look like that. What the water does to the old pipe system. This is drinking water. This is literally pulled out within the last couple weeks. We do it with our hands. Every two inches, you should hear it quick. So for an adult, it has to be at least two inches. Company up. 29th USCT is about 74 men that came out of the city and county of Milwaukee. Those 74 men fought in Petersburg, Virginia. Most of you probably have never heard of that place. And believe me, I had not either until I did my research. Like everything shouldn't be about money. You should learn how to do things from the heart and for, uh, you know, just genuinely caring about people. That was Akil Scott who was part of a core of young people volunteering on this day. This event gave young people from the top teens of America and the deputants from Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, which I'm involved with, a chance to give back to the community. Well, we came out here to volunteer for the back to school um, jam they're having, and we just want to help the kids out by, you know, letting them play, have fun out here, get some energy off. Volunteering is very important. It's important to give back to your community because a lot of times some people they talk about how the community is bad and all that stuff, but they don't do anything to help or I don't know try to improve the condition of it. I feel that volunteering actually helps the community and gets kids out to do more and actually let them learn. You also learn from volunteering. What is Top Teams of America? Uh, it's a community-based uh, organization in Milwaukee where we help different um, services around the area. We help the community out with different um, service opportunities around the community. I'm here to volunteer to give out backpacks for what the two dogs are doing. Uh, it helps me with leadership skills, learning how to organize things, and really helping me uh, organize my team back here, and really helps with leadership. What do you tell your peers about volunteering? Uh, that's good for uh, when you apply for colleges. Also, it just helps you come together as a team, if you're with a team, and also for the community. The news and stuff, it's a lot of stuff about like things going negative, and I want to like be positive and help, try to help out, like do something positive for people. I tell everyone that I talk to that they should help out. I mean, it matters. And why does it matter? It matters because you want to be remembered for something. Like, I would rather be remembered for helping. And this is what these young people did. Pitched in and worked along with the men of Omega Psi Phi to help kickstart the educational year with fun and information. 
Prostate cancer is the second most common cause of cancer deaths in the United States. It's especially deadly among African American men, but it doesn't have to be. In a moment, James Causey will talk with a doctor about good prostate health measures. But first, Everett Marshburn has this profile of two prostate cancer survivors. Men have a problem with doctors inserting their fingers up into the rectum for, for whatever the reason may be. Men, I mean, I'm, I'm not no freak, but if, it come, if, it's, it's, if it's life over death, you know, examine me the way you got to examine me and stuff. At the age of 40, Hudson Avery Jr. had his first prostate exam. That was in 1994 and he discovered that he had an enlarged prostate. From 19, basically, um, I say 1994 until now, I, I had no real big problem with my prostate. And um, then in, in like June, July of 2014, I noticed that I was having to use the restroom more frequently. That led to tests, blood work, and the biopsy. And they did a biopsy, took 12 SNPs, as they call it. And out of the 12, seven out of the 12 was found to be cancerous. How'd that make you feel? <laughs> I, I felt so scared. I felt so scared because the, the C word, the cancer, is like an automatic death sentence. But the good thing they said to me was that uh, it, it was treatable. You know, I wasn't, they didn't, it, there was not a six month limit on my life and stuff, you know, and they said to me, in a, you know, they said, in fact, Mr. Avery, if you ever had to have cancer, if you ever had to volunteer for cancer, prostate cancer is the line that you would want to get into. They told me, they said, well, Mr. Avery, you can, you can have hormone shots, you know, or you can have chemo you know, certain forms of other forms of radiation, or you can have the surgery. I had the surgery January the 30th, and uh, they initially told me it was going to be an overnight stay, but I ended up staying in the hospital till like about the 4th or the 5th of, of uh, February. I went in on, on a Friday, and I came home on a Thursday. Spencer Coggs was the treasurer for the city of Milwaukee. In 2006, he was in the Wisconsin State Senate when he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. I actually felt like my body had betrayed me because I'd never been to the hospital before. I'd never had a major surgery and never really had any problems with anything. And yet here I am now uh, in my late 50s with prostate cancer. So um, I thought about my family history and my family history wasn't great in terms of, you know, hypertension uh, and other maladies that black males oftentimes have. So made a very quick decision uh, to everybody's relief to go ahead and have the surgery. Most men are afraid of a prostate cancer diagnosis because First, they think about the old days when you had surgery and many times men came back impotent or in, uh, incontinent, okay? And so I, I had those same concerns like every other male. But in talking to the doctors, the surgeries have changed in all these years, okay? And my doctor was going to give me what they call nerve sparing surgery, which means after the surgery, everything still works, okay? Now, when you tell a person like me that, then I'm, I'm all for it, okay? And he had done thousands of surgeries over the years, so I had confidence in him. The surgery was successful, and Cogs fully recovered with no after effects. I went through the process, of monthly checkups, uh, three-month checkups, six-month checkups. Now I'm at a year-to-year -year checkup, and I'm proud to say that I went this year, and my diagnosis is completely fine. And ever since my surgery, they've been fine, and they've been consistent. I gotta tell you, I became a hero in my family. Uh, my daughter uh, flew in from Boston to see me, and she was just overjoyed, and to see, the look on her face because I lost my parents at an early age, okay? Uh, and I didn't want to see that happen to anybody else in my 
family. And to this day, my daughter still thanks me. And now we're joined by urologist Dr. Peter Slocum, uh, the primary physician for uh, City Treasurer Spencer Cox. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. My father is a prostate cancer survivor, so this means a lot to me. Um, can you uh, start out by telling uh, me and the guests when they should start PSA screenings? Yes, PSA screenings are especially important in people who have a family history of prostate cancer, African Americans who have a higher incidence of prostate cancer, and people who have prostate symptoms. Um, at this point, I would recommend, and most people recommend, starting at age 40 for annual screenings. And what are the symptoms? Unfortunately, there really aren't symptoms of early stage prostate cancer. And that's important because prostate cancer is curable when it's found at an early stage. If we detect it after it spreads somewhere else in the body, it's not curable. It's treatable, but it's not curable. So we need to find it at an early age, and there really are no symptoms of early stage prostate cancer. Most of the symptoms people talk about, like problems with urination, problems with uh, blood in the urinary ejaculate, problems with um, getting up at night, problems with a slow stream, those are all problems of an enlarged prostate, which is very common, but not necessarily prostate cancer, more commonly just benign enlargement of the prostate. That's why screenings are so important. That's the way we detect, detect early prostate cancer. If you have symptoms of um, prostate cancer, what should you do? What should you talk to your doctor about? Well, if you're starting to have voiding symptoms, that's when you should talk to your doctor. That's usually what brings you to the attention of the doctor and getting into the system to get evaluated for potential prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. So um, are there ways to reduce prostate cancer? Like, is there, should you change your diet? What can you do to keep yourself safe? Uh, again, unfortunately, there isn't any good evidence of any particular foods or particular activities that can reduce the incidence of prostate cancer. Some people talk about reduction in fat in the diet, which may help. Uh, obesity has been linked to higher levels of prostate cancer. Um, but as in most cancers, things like uh, reducing fat in the diet, things like um, plenty of fruits and vegetables, which contain antioxidants, which help reduce the incidence of prostate cancer, things like that are important, but it's really um, boils down to genetics for the most part. Family history. Family history and African Americans more than uh, Caucasians and Asians less. Yeah, so it's the test that a lot of men worry about. How invasive is this test? Well, the PSA test is just a blood test. Okay. Just like any other blood test, very simple, very straightforward. So at age 40, you should be getting a PSA test every year. Um, the other test is called a digital rectal exam, and that just involves checking the prostate. The prostate and the rectum are right next to each other. Okay. So you're able to actually feel the back side of the prostate with a digital rectal exam. Um, we're looking for nodules, asymmetry, hardness, anything that might feel suspicious. And those are the two mainstays at this point uh, for detection of prostate cancer early when it's curable. Well, you know, a lot of men worry about, you know, intimacy being affected. Um, has that changed over time? Has, has uh, medical procedures gotten better? Yes. Um, the two mainstays of treatment for prostate cancer are surgery or radiation. Uh, surgery is usually the um, best option for a younger, healthy man. Uh, potential complications can be problems with erections or problems with incontinence. And both those have improved dramatically with the, uh, the changes in the surgeries um, over the last 25 years. Wow. I know um, at the start of baseball season, they usually have a lot of testing done then. What's the connection between sports and getting the prostate checked? Um, probably the connection is simply getting into the system and getting your blood tests like you should for other things, but especially for prostate cancer, um, and coming to the attention of a physician who's going to give you an exam just because you need an exam to participate in sports. Right, right. So it's all about the relationship with your doctor, family history, and just really knowing your status and getting checked. Right. You need to know your family history especially, know if you're 
primary relatives, I like father or grandfather. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for coming on our show. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Before we close tonight, we have four pairs of tickets to Dream Girls, courtesy of the Milwaukee Rep. They're for viewers who can answer a question. Now, before I give you the question, here are the rules. You need to give us the correct answer to the question, your name, your address, and your phone number, or you will be disqualified. Many of the folks who responded to previous quizzes failed to give us all that information, and that made them ineligible. Here's the question. What actress won a Tony and a Grammy for her work in Dreamgirls? If you know the answer, call us at 414-297-7556 or email us at tvviewer at matc.edu. The contest closes at 6 p.m. on September 27, 2015. And that's Black Nouveau for this week. I'm Joanne Williams. Thanks for watching. Good night.